<laughs> so let me pause. <laughs> Amy, uh, Dr. Lingo, as we get uh, it going, uh, if you'd like to provide starting yeah. the brief introductions. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Craddock. I would just like to welcome all of you, faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends of the College of Education and Human Development. We are thrilled to introduce our new speaker series. Our hope is to invite community members, alumni, faculty, and our staff each month to speak to our college. We know that we are stronger as a college when we collaborate with our colleagues across the university as a whole, collaborating with our community partners and other universities across the country. It is our hope and our goal that this series will work toward increased collaboration and thought sharing among some of the greatest thinkers in this country. The topic of our conversation today is Black Louisville, then and now, an examination of the impact of the University of Louisville in the West End, past, present, and future. Who better to add to this discussion than our panel speakers? Welcome, Dr. Henry Cunningham, Senator Gerald Neal, and Lamont Collins to the CEHD virtual space. I would like to personally thank you all for your time and contributions this afternoon. Thank you all again for joining us and welcome to this conversation and discussion. We look forward to your participation and learning from our panel members. I would like to now introduce Dr. Douglas Craddock and Dr. Geneva Stark, who will serve as moderators of the panel. And again, thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, Dr. I mean, Senator Joe O'Neill is on with us and I'm the director of the Knight Street Center of Excellence in Education at the University of Louisville. And our whole goal is to be able to, how do we make sure that we're connecting community, higher education, and also K-12? Because as we all know, that we cannot do this work alone. And there's a lot of work to be done. And I think collectively, we have done a lot, but there's still more work to be done. And so our panel is going to join us in a discussion and conversation about where we've been, where we are, and where we're trying to go in the future. So again, I'll continue to follow us because we're here to provide information to our community. So once again, I'm Dr. Geneva Stark, Director of the Knight Strand Center of Excellence in Education at the University of Louisville. And again, um, thank you, Dr. Amy Lingo, for your leadership. Uh, we truly appreciate you know, what you brought to the College of Education and Human Development. And we continue to thank you for the leadership that you provided for us to have this space to be able to have these conversations because it's about having those courageous conversations is what's gonna make us all better for the future. So thanks again. And I'm, Dr. and I'm Dr. Douglas Craddock, I'm sorry. I am clinical assistant faculty within, uh, the, within the higher ed, uh, but also the chief of staff uh, for Dean Lingo. Uh, pleasure to be a part of this uh, group on today. Uh, thankful for being a part of the leadership team uh, here in the college. I'm often joke with Dean Lingo and tell her I'm probably the first chief of staff that rocks cornrows in our office with a hoodie. Uh, so I'm very, very excited uh, to be a part of all that and make that happen. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, now we will give the floor to our panelists, uh, allow them to introduce themselves uh, moving forward. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Henry Cunningham. Thank you, Dr. Credit. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Henry Cunningham. Um, I serve as Director of Community Engagement um, here at the University of Louisville. So my work takes me across the university as I work with faculty and administrators across the university in teaching and research that impacts our community. It is a pleasure to be here this afternoon with all of you. Thank you very much, um, Senator Jerry O'Neill. Good evening, this is Gerald Neal, and I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for allowing me to participate. Uh, I am a, an attorney professionally. I serve as a senator for the 33rd Senatorial District, which includes the West End, the largest uh, black populated area uh, in Kentucky. Uh, but also I'm a product of the West End, born and raised and still live in what's referred to as the West End. So. This should be, uh, I'll be more than happy to relate my experiences and see if we can, can contribute uh, to this discussion. Thank you, Senator Neal. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Collins? Collins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm Lamont Collins, founder and CEO of Roots 101 African American Museum, born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. 
uh, probably moved, uh, lived in several neighborhoods over a period of time, took a little piece of it with me everywhere I went from Smoketown to, to uh, Montclair subdivision to uh, 16th and Broadway. So I'm a piece of all of Louisville. Um, been here 62 years, went to University of Louisville, played football at UofL. Uh, went to Fern Creek High School. I'm in their uh, high school uh, athletic hall of fame. Uh, always been around just top role models in Louisville all my life. Had an opportunity to be president of several organizations here in town. Uh, always been part of the movement for young people. And just glad to be part of what you guys are doing now. And being a UofL grad, you know, just seeing what you guys are doing now. In 1980, 81, when I graduated, uh, you know, you guys come a long way. And I, I appreciate it just seeing my university has come a long way. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go through the questions. And um, for the audience, um, there will be a time at the end where there will be a Q&A. But if you'd like to put some, pose some questions in the chat box, then please feel free to do so. But we're going to start with um, Dr. Cunningham. You know, in your work as the Community Engagement Director at the University of Louisville, please share with us some of the things that have happened, some of the things that's going on, and, and your work across the West End. Thank you, Dr. Stark. Um, I feel like the odd man out here among uh, our panelists, because both panelists are from the Louisville area, reside in West Louisville, have worked in West Louisville, and here I am, uh, an outsider, um, I was even born in the United States, didn't even grow up in the United States. So I feel like an odd man he, um, here. Um, I'm still learning Louisville, but I must say my work at the University of Louisville has taken me into West Louisville on numerous occasions. I spent a lot of my time um, driving to various um, sites in West Louisville, working with uh, different partners that the university has in West Louisville. So I feel as though I'm slowly becoming a Louisvillian and a West Louisvillian, slowly but surely. Not sure if I'm quite there yet, but I'm getting there. Um, as director of community engagement at the university, my role is to work with faculty and administrators across the university in terms of how can we get um, the university's presence in our community? Um, how can we utilize our intellectual capital to, that, that is teaching and research to engage with partners in the community? Um, much of this work is done through what we call the Signature Partnership Initiative. The Signature Partnership Initiative is um, a, a partnership with West Louisville, our, with, with the school districts, with um, churches, with faith-based institutions, with um, the business community and others, neighborhoods, in trying to collaborate to address issues that we see have impacted West Louisville. Many of these issues have been around for many, many years. And so the university um, by no means can address all of these issues overnight. But we believe by partnership, by collaboration, you know, we can help to all alleviate some of the concerns that exist um, in our community of West Louisville. So through the signature partnerships, we have been engaging in educational programs. We have been engaging in economic development programs in health initiatives uh, with our health science campus and try to address the, the, the various disparities that we see that exist um, in the West Louisville um, community. As a university, we do not have finan the financial resources that the business community has. What we have is intellectual capital. That is the expertise of our faculty and students. And so that is what we as a university utilize in trying to address the needs of the, uh, the community. Community engagement is what I call a method. It's a method for teaching. It's a method for conducting research. And so our faculty use community engagement in their teaching where students are engaged with members of the community as part of their course, where students um, apply concepts learned in the classroom to real world issues, while at the same time, they, um, they gain real world experience. 
And so that is one way that as a university, we are engaged with the um, community um, through teaching. And likewise, faculty who engage in research as well, partner with, um, with our various stakeholders to, to, to study and find answers to pressing community issues that exist. Um, in the area of healthcare, um, our health science campus has been very, very active um, in working with West Louisville. Our schools of medicine, dentistry, and nursing have been working with our um, health clinic, the, the Park Duval Health Clinic, as well as the Portland Health Clinic, to provide clinicals um, for members of the community in which they can um, provide health services to this community. In addition, we have um, students at the School of Nursing um, who are engaged in, um, in health education programs in our school districts, um, in schools in uh, uh, Atkins Elementary, Horton Elementary, and other schools in West Louisville. And so as nursing students, they can, they can educate these students on health issues, how they can be healthy. And that is one role that uh, our School of Nursing um, uh, is played in the community. Um, our School of Business, likewise, using the expertise of our faculty, is engaging in, um, in, in programs in, in the community. Our Ford Center for uh, Entrepreneurship partners with members of the um, West Louisville community to provide training to young entrepreneurs or, or, or those who are interested in starting their own business. That is the expertise that our College of Business has, and they are providing those kinds of uh, training to uh, members of the com community. Um, similarly, there is an interest to get more minorities involved in certain um, career fields. And so this College of, College of Business offers a dual credit course at Central High School. And the goal is to introduce these students to the field of business so that we can get more um, of a minority um, young people into the field of business. Similarly, we have uh, a program um, with the schools of medicine, the school of nursing, um, public health and information sciences, and the school of dentistry. We're trying to, um, to um, develop a health magnet program to introduce the, the health field to members of um, the West Louisville community um, at Central High School, because the goal is to get more minorities into the healthcare field. So that's the kind of services that we are providing um, to our community. Um, the Kent School of Social Work through um, uh, research being conducted there with our, uh, our faculty are engaging in trying uh, um, to understand fatherhood among our African-American males. What is fatherhood like? What are some of the challenges that um, our black fathers face? And so uh, our faculty in the School of Social Work is using um, data that is gathered to provide training um, to um, families and fathers in West Louisville and other uh, parts of the com community. So again, here we are conducting research to better understand the issues and then using the knowledge that we gain to, uh, to provide services um, to members of the um, community. Um, Thank you for that, Dr. Powell. I just want to close one here. Um, the signature partnership, I, mean, I could go on and talk about this forever and ever, but I know there's a is limited time. But I must say here before I um, close up is that it's a universe wide initiative where every school and college, as well as administrative units, are involved in this work. And what I give just a few examples of the work that, that is being done. Hey, thank you, Dr. Cunningham. And again, the Ninth Strand Center. Um, has the five signature partnership schools. So we work closely with um, Dr. Um, Dr. Cunningham. And so we are very, very grateful to extend and expand you know, that partnership. And thank you for your leadership um, with the um, community engagement under the direction of Dr. Fitzpatrick. So thank you all for what you're doing and the continual relationship with that. So thank you. And we're gonna come back to you. So just know that you know it's not over. <laughs> We have some additional questions for you. So um, we're going to go with Senator Gerald Neal. Um, again, you indicated that you were born and raised in the West End and you still reside in the West End and you, uh, you represent the West End you know, as, a, as a senator. So hey, talk to us about um, past, present and future. 
Well, I guess we can start with the beginning. Okay. And thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I was born and raised uh, in the West End. I was born in Beecher Terrace, actually, uh, which was a housing project. Actually, it was a step up at the time that I was born there because that was uh, a housing that was provided because the housing that uh, African Americans uh, had access to during that period were pretty much deteriorated. And this is part of that whole housing piece around 1943 and 44, 45 and so forth. Uh, but I was born there and then we moved to a California neighborhood. And I must say, all of this was in a segregated context. And we moved into California, but I had nothing but a warm embracing uh, framework to develop in up until the time I was 13, it was community. And everyone uh, embraced the young people, the, the whole piece, but we were isolated uh, from the majority community. We were boxed in by segregation. It wasn't until the sixth grade that uh, they desegregated the elementary schools. And so I didn't have to walk eight blocks to elementary school anymore. I could walk right around the corner uh, with respect to that. So we moved to uh, uh, a subdivision, actually an African-American uh, developer, uh, subdivision called Algonquin Gardens in the west, further west towards uh, Chickasaw Park. And uh, that was an upscale existence. And again, I had a tremendous experience as a, a young person growing up uh, with respect to that particular piece. But over time, it became very apparent that a lot of other types of forces were taking place. Uh, that governmental policy, uh, for instance, not to mention governmental policy, but the fact that there was a concentration of, of poverty in terms of that particular evolution, in terms of the, uh, the community going forward. Some of the people that were rocks, bedrocks of the community became absentee landlords in terms of their properties and so forth. Uh, and of course you have that whole cycle of, of uh, gentrification uh, taking place. And right now you find maybe 39, 40% of home ownership. Uh, uh, a great many of those individuals are, are older. Uh, so you get into a generational uh, problem there. And then the rest you see mostly uh, what? Deteriorated houses that are abandoned and so forth, and as well absentee landlords on the rest of it. So it is a threatened community. It's a vulnerable community. And uh, those things uh, uh, you would find in communities like that, plus such as uh, a poor relationship, in fact, sometimes a deadly relationship between the police and the community. Not that the vast majority, I believe, of police do their job and do it properly. There are those who don't. So that community, it was sort of looked upon and, and still, I would argue, is looked upon by many as uh, something to contain, uh, something to be wary of. Uh, and I, I won't go into the litany of, of abuses that culminated in, in the iconic uh, tragic death of Breonna Taylor. But that economic disparity, the police accountability issues, uh, the issues regarding deteriorating houses and that rental versus home ownership piece knocks out the ability for generational uh, wealth. There's nothing that can happen that will be very significant in that area other than intentional, massive uh, in, um, uh, investment in terms of this. I'll say it again, intentional, massive investment. And that means a coordination between public and private entities in, in accomplishing this. And I'd like to say this now, because I can announce it right here on your program, is that today uh, the Senate president and I filed a bill, Senate Bill 100, Senate Bill 125, to uh, become part of that, where we are going, our, our intention is to leverage, if we're successful in getting this through the legislature, $30 million aimed right at northwest of 9th Street and north of Algonquin Parkway to the river. So it's very intentional, it's very targeted, it's a, it's a tool, it's not a panacea, but we think it would generate other activities and others to bring attention to that area. So there's hope uh, in this particular type of uh, initiative. I'll stop right there and perhaps we can come back to some of that discussion. Okay. And, and to engineer, you did attend the Brandeis? Yeah, I graduated from law school at the University of Louisville, attending University of Michigan in graduate school. And, um, of course, uh, I, I went to Central High School, the traditional black school, but I graduated from Shawnee High School. Okay. Uh, so I've, I've been around the institutions in the, in the West. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Neal. Uh, Mr. Collins, um, as we begin to think about and continue our conversation about 
the past, the present, and the future, um, and the work that you've had the chance to do. Um, I'm gonna direct this question towards Roots 101 Museum um, and its importance of the void that you were seeking to fill uh, with that museum. Um, so can you take some time out to discuss how the past, present, and future directly connects to Roots 101 Museum, um, in particular, not just the Louisville community, but West End, but also the university and your thoughts around that? Yeah, I think it's all the above. A good question. Uh, Route 101 was designed to be uh, telling the story of the African American journey. The reason I called it Route 101 in higher education, the first class you take is a 101. Uh, what I saw, even growing up as a young child in Louisville, I'm not as old as Gerald, but I remember Gerald when I was a little baby. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. But, but, but uh, but, you know, I, I mean, like Gerald said, there's so many people that were so responsible for so many things in Louisville when we grew up. So for me to do a museum was just a natural fit. When I think of uh, the George Unsels, and I think I've told you guys before, uh, 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 Dr. Coleman, I mean, Lewis Coleman, Dr. James Coleman, Dr. Frazier, all these people that were instrumental in my life growing up, uh, uh, Coach Carter, you know, as a sports guy, uh, so I always saw role models as a way of getting out or understanding in Louisville because at that time I grew up, everyone stopped you on the corner to talk to you, right? So Route 101 is just an offshoot of the love and respect that I have for Louisville, but it's also an offshoot of the love I have for our community and for Black, for black people. So it's something that was a natural fit. I was grown, grew up under history all my life. I had history makers around me. My grandmother had a beauty salon. My grandfather helped start Continental National Bank, one of the smartest uneducated men I ever knew. Didn't have more than a uh, sixth grade education, but just rose to, to unbelievable feats, uh, Daniel B. Seals. So I grew up uh, pretty much all parts of Louisville. So the museum was just a connection of all parts of the community. When Gerald talks about the West End, my connection is not the West End. My connection is a combination of everything. When I was a little boy, when we lived on 16th and Broadway, my dad would put us in a car every Friday and drive intentionally to every white neighborhood he wanted to, to say one day he was going to move into it. So, so my idea is that Louisville was bigger than one area, that Black people lived everywhere, and that uh, the West End of Louisville, when I grew up, was predominantly white until the segregation, I mean, until uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the race riots happened, and then it kind of flipped the switch. So I never really had a connection to West Louisville as a sense of belonging, but had a sense of connection that we belonged anywhere we wanted to go. That makes sense. So Route 101 is all suit. The reason we're so important is that we're telling that story to tell kids they're descendants of kings and queens that were enslaved in America. And that's, a, that's what we haven't heard. We haven't heard, I mean, we've heard a, a, a descendants of slaves, but that's not the story I tell. I tell the story that we were more than that before I came here. And our story was stolen when we came here, but we had a history before we came here. And that's the psyche that I use, not whether one's right or wrong, it just, this is what I was given to, to run with. So I try to tell kids that there's a story before the story. And our job and my narrative is to continue that story, whether that's connected with University of Louisville, connecting with board education. And that's my greatest need, Doc, is to make other people understand how is important is for kids to understand who they are and what they are and what they can be. And that's why I stand on Route 101 because we've, we've got national attention with a budget of a dime. And that's the honest truth. You can take a toothpick and look at our budget and we don't have one. We haven't got the connections to the politicians or corporations to buy into the story we're telling. And we know it's a heavy lift because it's a heavy lift because we're breaking the myth of supremacy. If I tell kids they were a bulldozer before bulldozers, the jackhammer for jackhammers and the engineering before engineering degrees. I'm saying even as slaves, we helped build this place. We helped build America. We built DC, Benjamin Banneker, Banneker. We built uh, DeSalvo in Chicago. So we have achieved as black people since we've been here. The black experience has always been an excellent experience. And that's something Route 101 will always talk about 365 days a year. It, 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 I got more phone calls in February from just our black community that I got through the whole year. Well, if we don't understand it's more important in February, it's hard for them to understand. So that's why I continue to do what I do. Uh, just got three Zooms today. I did one with Sacred Heart School, one with uh, 
the Board of Education to just grow the roadmap of what we, it was a Black Student Union at Akron High School, because we have to be intentional. I heard someone say intentional. We have to plot and plan what our next step is. And our plot and plan is for Louisville, Kentucky to have a national recognized African-American museum that's making a difference in every kid's life, whether they're Black, whether they're purple, whether they're brown, we matter. And what we say at Roots 101, legacies matter. And becoming a better ancestor matters because my job is to be better than my father and my father's father. And if you're better than your father and father's father, we're going to have a better community all around. So that's what Roots 101 is about. And that's the connection we need and partnerships we need to make it work. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Collins. Um, and also, anybody looks in the chat, uh, the website for Roots 101 Museum has been posted. So check out that link, become more informed. Um, and just information gathering is extremely important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stark. Um, Dr. Cunningham, again, um, oh, how long have you been at the University of Louisville? Uh, okay, that's an interesting question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> because okay. I've, had, I've had more than one stint with the university. Okay. Well, so I, I, okay. um, I first came to the University of Louisville um, as a Fulbright scholar. As you can tell, my accent is not a Kentucky accent. I am originally from Belize, Central America, and I speak a, I speak somewhat of a British Caribbean accent, is what I speak. Uh, Belize being a former British colony. And so I first came to the University of Louisville as a Fulbright scholar. Mm -hmm. I was here for two years, um, and uh, upon my time here, I became uh, very close with um, with my mentor, with whom I did some research. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as a Fulbright scholar, you must return home. That's a requirement. You must return home to your home country and, and serve a time. So I did go back to Belize for, for three years. Mm -hmm. My mentor and I um, kept in touch. And so he invited me to join him back here at the university. And so that is how I came back to U of L. And I ask that question because I want to know, as a Fulbright Scholar and now as a Director of Community Engagement, um, what are some of the things that, improvements that you've seen or progress you've seen um, at the University of Louisville that um, things that, um, because again, we talk about past, present, you were a Fulbright Scholar, which was an honor in itself. And now as a Director of Community Engagement, you know, have what progress have you seen on campus that's making an impact um, just from your lens, I mean, I know we have the five signature partnership schools, but even just as a, a, a personally, what have you seen? Or how do you feel? How does you feel mm -hmm. about what has happened on campus? And we know that um, Dr. Neely Vindapuli has mentioned about University of Louisville becoming an anti-racist university. You know, what were your experiences then and then now? You know, and how do you compare the two? Um, definitely infrastructure at the university has changed. Um, when, I, when I was first here at the university, there was, there was some involvement with the community, but not to the extent that I see it now. I think U of L is, uh, is making a conscious effort to engage with the community, something that was not being done when I was first here. There were some faculty who were engaged with the community, but it was not a concentrated, concerted effort that was across the institution. It was not in institutionalized. And that I think is the big difference where um, faculty are not given the support and the, provide the infrastructure um, to engage with the community. So that's a, a, a big difference that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Centennial, um, as a um, the difference is from a, uh, I think you, on the panel that I saw you on previously was you were a BSU, you was a part of the Black Student Union at the University of Louisville, you know, and uh, you were a professor at the University of Louisville. What are some of the things that you've seen and, and how the, uh, the transition or, or, the, or the results of, our in, in, I guess, improvements in terms of then and now? Well, that you can speak to. I, yes. Uh, when I first uh, engaged at the University of Louisville, there weren't that many black students at the University of Louisville, quite frankly. Uh, and we uh, sort of formed a, a colony, so to speak, uh, part of uh, just the social aspect, but also the academic piece. So we relied on each other to a degree. And we had some connections to the uh, university faculty, but prim primarily through people like the president University, actually we'd have direct contact with them through 
our organized efforts, which you referred to as the Black Student Union. And that Black Student Union was very important because we were demanding at the time that they increase the enrollment of Black students at the University of Louisville, that they provide certain types of supports, et cetera, that they had a Black Studies program. In fact, what you see in the University of Louisville, now the seeds were, were planted and actually put in place by the efforts of that Black Student Union. So, uh, so back in those days, it was a struggle. It actually led to, I, I guess, what we envisioned and what the faculty and, and the administration envisioned weren't on the same track. So it ended up in a couple of, you know, building takeovers of the president's office and so forth. And some students got kicked out of school and that sort of stuff. But the university did respond and they did uh, bring in a, a large influx, large, relatively speaking, influx of students at that time. And they continued, however, the university has always been a challenge. Any university is a challenge just to do the academic part, but uh, the racial relationships and so forth still uh, were manifest by separation uh, in terms of the relationship between white and black students in, in, in a more specific sense. So if I look at what was happening then as what is happening now, uh, I was talking about back in the 60s and early 70s, and now we're talking about 2020. That's a long time to get to where we are. Of course, now the university is not the same university as it was. I mean, if you look at the, the, the physical structure of the university now and the, the multiple uh, opportunities that it provides, it didn't have all of that then. It was a small university compared to what it is now. So I think the university has become very significant. It's always been significant, but I think it's become very significant in its uh, posture. And I, I, I like the tone of the leadership uh, with respect to the university because it has some, I like to use this word because it's a good word. It has some intentionality associated with it. And as uh, uh, Dr. Cunningham has pointed out, you have to bring the institutional piece and also you have to bring all those things that make that institutional piece relevant and functional. So I think uh, the more intentional the university is, the more it self-examines itself. And uh, I say that by virtue of what's been said, I think that's a, gonna be more of an arduous process than just the word spoken that we're anti-racist. That's a, that's a huge challenge in a, in a generationally and, uh, and, and, and centuries old problem in any aspect of the, of the, uh, of the uh, society that we have, however, uh, if, if, if it didn't start 40 years ago or 100 years ago or whatever, now is good enough. Let's go do it. So I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing coming out of the university. Uh, I do think that it's going to need more support. Universities are just to rip. I'm in politics, right? Universities are highly political, and it's a very tough environment, and it's a moving environment. I understand it very well. I try to stay a little bit away from it. But I will say one last thing. I've had the unique opportunity through people like my good friend who's gone now, Blaine Hudson, great, great scholar and human being and leader uh, to, uh, that's how I became a senior fellow at the university was through him. And he gave me the opportunity to uh, teach in, in the political science department uh, as well as Pan-African studies. And I have to say, it's probably one of the richest experiences I've ever had in my life. So I am jealous of those in academia that have the opportunity to deal with those young minds and see them blossom under the direction and the, the guidance of uh, in, in a professorial position. So I am hopeful about the university. I have great respect for it. And I think uh, if we stay with it and we support these efforts that are inside, we're gonna be fine. One last thing, if I may, I'm, I'm, I'm just one last thing. I think, I think we got to be careful though because the university took a turn like a lot of universities in sort of generalizing the position of black students. They made it, I guess they use the term multicultural. It sounds like a nice little term, but I think you run the risk of sort of uh, minimizing uh, the reality of black students in that in environment. So there has to be some real strong uh, asserting of identity, uh, supports, and, uh, and direction. I mean, people have to be part of the liberation of, of, of themselves and the community itself. So I, I invite the university's engagement with the uh, community. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Neal. 
Uh, Mr. Collins, uh, in the same uh, type of question, uh, reflecting on your student, reflecting on your time as a student here at U of L, um, have we reached your hopes for what the campus could look like? If you was on campus, 70s or 80s, and you could look forward and say, man, this is what I think campus should look like in 2021. Can you kind of describe what that thought, pre thought process might have been then compared to now? Well, <clears throat> let me say this. When I was there in the, uh, from 78 to 81, you know, we had issues then, and I'm sure the university has issues now. I personally backed away from the University of Louisville uh, when it got away from its urban mission. So I was an urban mission baby. When I came out in, eight, in the 70s, uh, Louisville had an urban mission. And what they did had an open mission for kids to come to school. And University College was that communication college. Uh, not that I may not have qualified for the other universities, but I went into University uh, College. And when I was in University College, uh, there's a professor by the name of Andy Williams who's passed along now. He was a former football player out there too. I remember him pulling me to the side and said, Lamont, you can do this. And my academics just changed like that. So I think Louisville has always had some, some very, like Blaine Hudson, like uh, Gerald said, uh, had some unbelievable black leadership as professors. But when I got older and when I got into my professional life, I kind of lost hope for U of L when it moved away from its urban mission for dollars. And I remember uh, the reason, and that Reverend Coleman was the same. I just, Reverend Coleman called me in the middle of the night. And I don't know if you remember Reverend Coleman, he's an old, old time protester in Louisville, probably one of the greatest that could ever get it. Before bullhorns became popular, he had a bullhorn when it wasn't popular. You know, he was calling everybody out. In the West End, East End, it didn't matter. That's the man he was. But uh, he, he saw a turn at UofL during that time that that really disturbed him. He would always call me and it seemed like I would always be on that side on what could we do to, to bring more black students to UL's campus. Uh, to look at UofL now, oh heck yes, yeah, a whole different campus uh, than when I was there. But I was involved with, uh, especially after I got into the football, I was involved with, I was student, uh, involved with the student council. I was vice president of Freckle Hall. Uh, we helped lead a thing with, uh, the Red Barn, which always had white events and no black events. I was in the middle of that. I was in the middle of, so I was always active at the school. So when I saw that move away from kids that never had an opportunity to go to college, would have to go to JCC in order to, to, to move through the system, I had a problem with that because I wasn't about kids all being 3.5 students. I was about kids that had an opportunity to learn. So I wasn't a statistical person that said a kid can't learn if they don't have a 3.5 or if they couldn't get into uh, uh, young black scholars program. So I had some issues with U of L when I saw that going on. I'm so proud of the new, proud of the new leadership that the new leadership is trying to define something different, but it's just a definition. Until you get to the results of that definition of racial inequality, you know, that's a definition that's been with us over 400 years, right? So uh, can a universally uh, turn that switch that quick? I don't know. But I do like the, the, the intentionality, as Gerald used, to try. But I would hold the university accountable if it doesn't do it. And I think that's my job from uh, uh, being part of the museum and being part of a graduate, is that I would love to see uh, results to what, you know, because you're not going to change the admission program. It's going to be what it is simply because of the ties with the ACC. And I get all those things. But when I saw it, I, it really bothered me uh, that that uh, intentionality of being an urban mission went out the window. And, and it's gonna be with me because I was a product of that mission and everything about me was a product of that mission. So that, that's the only thing I would say about U of L that I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a, I'm a watch and see what happens. I'm gonna see what kid can get through that door that doesn't have a 3.5. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Collins, uh, for those people you indicate that urban mission, can you explain that to the audience because so they can know exactly, um, so they can be clear when you say urban mission um, that we all are on the same page. Okay, when I, when I was going there, urban mission was they define the role of university law is to help those that uh, did not have help before. It was urban, it was in the city of Louisville. So how could they get students 
uh, that look like me to come to the university, right? So, and they drove off of that mission for maybe maybe 10 or 12 years. It was a, it was a big thing and Gerald might know more uh, on the history of that urban mission, but they brought in black professors. Uh, uh, you saw the uh, Pan-African Studies Department, which I'm a, I had a mind out of Pan-African Studies, go to a new level. So I was trying to do things to be intentional, again, uh, of trying to do the right thing. But when dollars came to effect, and urban mission basically was, we're gonna take this one university college called University College. And, and uh, don't get me wrong, Vanderbilt had the same program called Peabody College. Because if you went to Vanderbilt, especially with the athlete, they just put you in Peabody College and, and you just particularly through. But, but uh, at UofL, it was more intentional than that. You just got in University College and then you went to school business and then you declared your major. But it allows so many kids that came out of that busing system to have an opportunity to stay home and get a quality education. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's all it was. It was just an open admissions program, similar like Johnson C. Smith in Charlotte and some other historical black colleges mm-hmm. where kids had the opportunity to prove themselves when they got on college campus. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Craddock, okay. Yep, 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 yep. Thank y'all. So I'm part of it. I have to step away. I just got a call. I have to run to the daycare. I'm a new father. Um, but I ho- hopefully I'll be able to jump back on. Now this talk is going to continue to lead our conversation. And and again, I um, want to um, make sure that everyone was clear on what that means because we, we all want to be clear. We want clarity, you know, um, because when we speak in the same language, then we can move forward, you know, in the right direction. Um, so for um, Senator Neal, you know, as we look at a community, you know, and I know there's a lot. Um, you do the, the talk on um, on Saturday mornings or at noon, and you uh, head in charge of the African American Initiative policy. You know those are things that try to look at policies and procedures. What can we do? You know what can we expect, or um, how do we connect the university? What is the uh, what do we say? What's the expectation? Yeah, what do we expect? What do we need to move forward as a community? Because we can't do it in isolation. So what are some well, of your thoughts on how we can move forward as a community? Well, I, I guess there's two things involved in that. One is how does the community benefit from and engage with the university? Mm-hmm. And the other one is what happens to the university as an institution and how it generates uh, the substance in terms of, of uh, what it says it's about in relationship to the community because those things may not meet each other at the point of expectation, depending on where you're standing. In other words, you may talk that you're going to do certain things in relationship to the community. You can communicate with certain leadership in the community. You can, in fact, uh, have people get certain benefits from the university uh, that uh, Lamont was talking about. But the fact of the matter is, is that the, how robust and how sustained that effort is going to be really depends upon how the university institutionally commits itself uh, to sustain and long-term outcomes. So it's not just about the, you know, the, the community responding to the university, it's about how intentional and how um, focused the university is gonna be in terms of utilizing its resources to uh, achieve these objectives that is articulated. So when it says it's anti-racist, that's a good term, but what does it mean? Uh, if they're saying they're going to uh, engage the community and uh, Dr. Cunningham's in community engagement, uh, what does that mean? I'm, uh, he's busy doing his work, but how does that translate in terms of what the community does behind what he's doing? Uh, that's major, he needs tremendous support. I'm not assuming he doesn't have it, but I will tell you this, he needs all the support he can get uh, to, to do what I consider to be heavy lifting. And I'm sure he will agree that it's heavy lifting given the historical and generational issues related to race uh, and, and economics. Uh, if I can, I just gotta say this because when, when I found out that Dr. Cunningham was from Belize, I uh, brightened up a little bit because I started thinking about places like Belize City and Dandriga and Be- uh, Belmont Pan and, and these places that I've visited before, it's a delightful. If you've never been to Belize, 
You got to go because the people, it's all about the people. It's nothing, it's, it's the people. They're great people. But anyway, back to your point, I had to get in there because that excites me every time I think about my experiences in, in Belize. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've had many. Um, but I think, I think that I think that when you, uh, or as my dad used to say, and you probably heard, everyone's probably heard, if you want something to happen, you make it happen. You know, you don't just let it happen. You make it happen. You have to, we use this term intentional. That's what we're talking about. You put those things in place to make it happen. So if you're saying that you're going to have a robust um, expression of what your institution is about, then you got to put the muscle behind that. And you have to line up the support behind that. And then you have to connect that with people in the community that have uh, mutual um, positions and, and mutual expectations, and mutual uh, intentions in terms of reaching objectives that are, that are mutual. Uh, if that's done, then uh, Dr. Cunningham is going to come back. Uh, he's going to be smiling from ear to ear from now on because he's going to know he's got the muscle to do what he talks about. And then he can scale it. And that's part of this deal. So... I think, uh, but I think when you say it from the leadership, when the leadership says it, then the leadership knows they're owning it. And when they own it, they know they have to produce. And I think, uh, I think uh, leadership, Dr. Ben, uh, ben Dapudi is due credit for stepping out there on that particular ledge because it's risky because all universities, all communities are highly political with diverse expectations. Uh, everybody's been socialized in diverse ways. They have different expertise. It's hard to change people's behaviors. We know that. And when you take finite resources and begin to direct them to some area that some, is not someone else's priority, then it becomes a struggle. So um, I think I'll stop there. I don't want to take okay. all the time. Thank you. You know, and, and Dr. Cunningham, he mentioned about the various you know, areas of the university that's, um, that's in dealing with community engagement. You know, but also, I think U of L is recognized as one of the, you know, research um, community engagement. Um, Carnegie, you know, Dr. Cunningham, you know the language for that. Um, let the audience know what that how U of L um, ranks in terms of community engagement in this country. You know, and also the additional work. And, and as Senator Neal stated, it's not easy work; it's heavy lifting work. You know, but also, how do we continue? You know, being able to first tell us what that, you know, where, where U of L stands, but also the ongoing intentional work um, that's happening at the University of Louisville. Um, certainly. But first, I'm very happy to know that Senator Neal has been to my home country. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he knows about the Lee City and then Griga and all those cool places, that is very exciting. So <laughs> we've got to talk some more offline, you and I. We gotta we gotta exchange some notes. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of where the university is right now, the Carnegie Foundation for the um, Advancement of Teaching is, the, the, is a national organization that provides rankings to institutions. There are two types of ranking. One is your research ranking. The University of Louisville has the highest ranking in research. We call it a research one or high you know, intensity research which is great because we are recognized among um, a few institutions in the country to have this this high research ranking. The other classification is called community engaged classification. And you get this classification from the Carnegie based on um, how involved you are as as a university with your community. And to get this ranking, you must show evidence evidence of your faculty engaging in the community in teaching and research, evidence of um, your students engaging in the community, evidence of dollars being spent um, through grants and other initiatives um, you know, in the community as well. And you know, I must say, I'm very happy to know that as a university, we receive lots of um, grant funding where we collaborate with members of the community. Um, the, for example, the School of Public Health, has a $5.1 million grant where they are working um, in West Louisville in the um, Youth Prevention Center. And the goal is to, um, to study youth violence. And you look at different um, kinds of uh, media that we can use to educate young people on youth violence. And that is um, a grant funded project 
that the School of Public Health and Information Sciences uh, is working on. So, um, you know, it, it is very good that we have this kind of airport, but it, it's important that as a university, that faculty also feel supported in this work. And that is a big challenge. Faculty must feel supported in this work. Um, many times um, I talk to my colleagues across the country and they ask us the same question, you know, are our faculty um, supported? Do faculty feel supported? And that I think is the, is, um, the big challenge um, in this work because it does take time to engage in the community. It takes more time to, to, to teach a community-based learning course than to teach a course the, the traditional way. Because I cannot just I cannot just, just go and call Mr. Lamont and say, Mr. Lamont, do you want to work with me? You don't know me. We've never worked together. So we've got to build trust. And building trust takes time. So our faculty need to spend time in the community talking with our partners, getting to know people, getting to understand the issues. And before sometimes in any real work um, can done. And that is a challenge. That is something, it, it takes much longer to, to um, develop those, those um, the trust level that is needed for true collaboration and partnerships. You know, and, and again, um, as you stated, it's um, changing hearts and minds is not easy. You know, it, it is a process, but it has to be intentional as well um, because uh, again, it, it's a heavy lift. And, mm -hmm. and that's why we can't work in isolation. We have to work collectively together and with all the organizations that's there. Um, and, and again, we want the university and we are thankful, you know, but also know that there's still more work to be done and the work is not, is, the job is not done just yet. You know, and so we want the community to continue. We want the university to continue to be intentional you know, in that work. So, Mr. Collins, um, um, you know, you talked, spoke about the urban mission and the uh, University of Louisville um, being staying true to the mission, you know, and I guess even Centennial, we all looking, we all want the University of Louisville to be true to the mission because uh, we're sitting in the middle of the, of the 26th largest school district in the country with 157 school sites uh, and more than 57% students of color. And, and so there is opportunity to be able to work closely with the community. It has to be the intention and the will and desire to make it happen. So with that being said, um, is there anyone, anyone wanna add anything else to, uh, as we move forward, before we move forward with the questions you know, from the audience? Can I say this? Uh, yes. uh, when, when I talk about the academic side, which U of L is all on top of, it's the holistic side that I want to see. I want to see the university do other avenues, which Dr. Cuttingham said, partnerships to reach all kids. Because all we know from the statistical data we have just from Jefferson County, some kids are not making it through, right? So what can you, if we're talking about racial divide, what are we going to do as a university to touch everyone from a holistic approach? What other approach can you do other than academia to reach kids? What other partnerships will they do? What other uh, tech, you know what I mean? That, that's what I wanna see. I know what it does academically here. I know what it says with Carnegie, but I'm talking about that kid that's here, that's a holistic learner, not an analytical learner, but needs the opportunity to learn and opportunities to move forward. That's what I wanna see my university do, is, is, is not take the accolades of academia, because we know what accolades of academia do, it keeps us from those universities in many cases. I don't want to see our university become that university. If we're going to take the, the mantra of being uh, uh, whatever that title is of racial inequality, it means it has to go past academia to reach the community it's trying to reach. And one of the things that you stated earlier, which is so true, and I've said to many times, is that yes, we want to, there's an intentional focus on the West End, but you know, Black people live all over Jefferson County. And mm -hmm. so we need to make sure that we don't just focus on one part of town when we have kids all over this county, because again, we're at 57.4% you know, of student population and JCBS students of color. So we need to make sure that, that the work happens across the county to get all the stakeholders from across the entire county, not just focused on one area, because people tend to think, oh, well, they're just working on this area. 
Well, again, we are all over Jefferson County, so it has to be uh, a platform that's universal across the county. Dr. Stark, if you don't mind, may I share something here? Yes. I, I fully agree with Mr. Lamont about the fact that this needs to be a holistic approach mm -hmm. um, in terms of dress, uh, addressing the needs of education um, in our young kids. Um, you know, that is something that's a universe we are, we are attempting to do. And I'll, I'll give one example. Um, I'll use one of our elementary school in West Louisville, where our College of Education and Human Development is actively engaged with this uh, elementary school, where uh, faculty are providing professional development um, for teachers in the school. Uh, we are placing students in, in the school to work alongside teachers, um, to, you know, to provide an additional, um, you know, warm bodies to work with these kids you know, providing a kind of academic support that the College of Education has the expertise um, um, to provide. In addition to that, we, we realize there's also a need for social services. Our Ken School of Social Work is working with the Youth Services Center in, uh, in this, this school, where our um, social work um, graduate students provide uh, one year of internships uh, working again, with the Youth Service Center to provide the social services that many of our kids need to survive. Because we realize that for students to do well academically, you must address other needs that they have. And many times the social needs they have um, need to be addressed before you can uh, provide um, the academic need. In addition, I, um, our schools of nursing, medicine are involved in healthcare, providing um, health services or a school of dentistry is providing free dental services because if kids are if kids are sick if they have dental issues if they're not healthy they cannot be in school and they are sick they are absent they cannot learn so we must address health as well um, so when you think about education it has to be a holistic approach are we doing it well or we do it um, you know fully probably not there is always rooms for improvement but we are attempting to address the other areas. Um, even our athletics department is involved where our student athletes are involved in our elementary school, tutoring and mentoring kids. Um, uh, we cannot be in high school nor middle school, but we can um, send our student athletes into elementary school. And so they are also engaged, again, mentoring these kids, guiding them, helping them with homework, you know, providing that additional kind of support that, that they need to be successful. So we're trying to use as many of the resources we have. Again, as a university, our job is to teach and do research. And so we have to use what is at our disposal, our intellectual capital to address the needs of, of the community. And that is what we are attempting um, to do. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Neal, any, any parting words before we get the Q&A, the questions? Just that you, you should not underestimate the intellectual capital. That intellectual capital is very powerful. And to have a university in the midst of Louisville uh, with the intellectual capital that University of Louisville has is, is a gift to the community. The question is, how is it gonna be utilized? How is it connected? Uh, to the realities uh, in the community itself. And I think the point is, uh, just to give you an example, I just told you about this new initiative that if it passes the uh, House and the Senate, it's gonna be a major tool. It's not gonna be a panacea, but it's gonna be a major, major tool in terms of uh, the issues we're talking about related to poverty and generational wealth and et cetera, et cetera. It's gonna take time to do those. Well, just imagine what that means. You can't just go around floating around trying to do this thing. They're going to need the intellectual capital of this university um, in many phases of what it's trying to do in terms of that community. It's, it, they may even redirect and be more creative in terms of how they may organize around new initiatives and dynamics in the community. So I draw your attention to that, uh, Dr. Cunningham, because if this is successful, the university is going to be key in this process. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Collins. Um, any parting words before we get to the Q and A? No, I'm loving it. I'm loving it, and I'm a proud graduate, so I'm loving everything you're saying. Very good. Um, 
there was um, a comment and uh, if anyone, um, someone mentioned about the ACT test um, should not be, uh, it, it's a way of keeping individuals out. And we know that standardized tests have done that for years, not only the ACT, but the Praxis and the GREs. And we know that those, those assessments um, do not really dictate what a person can and cannot do. However, those are the, those are the structures or the systems that's in place. You know? So uh, I don't know how do we dismantle that, you know, because that's an institutional um, problem, um, because a systemic problem, because it's happening. And of course, we know that there's many dollars. <laughs> you know, uh, it's about follow the money, follow the dollars, follow, follow, follow the dollars. Many people are taking those tests. And so someone is becoming financially wealthy because as a result of that. And those are barriers that keep many of uh, people of color out of those classrooms and out of institutions. And when Mr. Collins mentioned about the urban mission, then sometimes that ACT test could be something that has kept individuals out of those classes. You know, that, that raises an interesting question, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you start thinking about multiple intelligences, mm -hmm. uh, let's say Gardner's work or Sternberg's work, you begin to realize that a lot of the testing that's going on really doesn't capture the experience of a number of the people who take it. So it becomes a very difficult uh, pro uh, exercise for a number of people. Mm -hmm. uh, plus just the skill and learning the skill of test taking mm -hmm. in and of itself is a major uh, piece in that particular um, point. I think it, it does need looking at, but guess what? They've been looking at it for a long time and it still manifests itself. So. I think there's some work to be done in that area. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Rita Greer, um, um, she's a longtime educator and um, in, in our community. Um, any comments? You know, I'm not gonna let you just sit there and say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dr. Greer. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Greer, they caught you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good afternoon. A couple of things. Thank you for the opportunity. A couple of things uh, that I thought early on, because I've been at the University of Louisville since 1967. Um, when the one thing earlier, when you were talking about the change, uh, in 1966, uh, I was a National Merit, National Achievement Scholar colleges and universities from all over the country uh, were sending letters to my home asking me to come to them. They knew I could do the work, my, okay? I lived here in Louisville. University of Louisville never ever sent a letter to me, not ever. So from there to where we are now, we have climbed mountains. I came back to, I went to the University of Kentucky, heaven forbid, but I did go to the <laughs> University of Kentucky. But I came back to the University of Louisville that next year because I got married and came home. And then I stayed in the University of Louisville. Once I got there, I had no problems with the entry. Once I got there, I was in the political science department. Those folks were wonderful. They took care of me, they helped me, they supported me. But the issue that I guess that always rankled me was they never invited me. They never invited me. And I think in 1985, I came to U of L uh, as a part of a community program, Jefferson County Schools and U of L. Minority Teacher Recruitment Project. I wrote the program with U of L and JCPS. One of the things that we did, we began to invite. We invited students from all over. It's in the College of Ed. We invited students, we invited students, we invited students. And that was all, that's what always rankled me that the university had not intentionally invited students until I would say in the 80s that we really began, you invited athletes, 
you invited athletes, you invited students that were 4.0 at Atherton, but you didn't invite just a regular old 2.5, 2.75 student to come. And I think that's one of the things um, that Dr. Lamont is talking about, those students that don't have the support or sometimes don't even have the inclination. They don't even know that they should be going. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that we've got to make sure mm -hmm. as we work at our projects, as Henry, as we work in the community, as we talk to people, as the university goes out, we've got to continue to give those students hope, but not at the not at the detriment, we want those students with the 3.5s too. So how do we actually put that piece together where we're both working both ends of the spectrum so that we can build that minority student population? I was fortunate because the professors that I had were actually insightful and they were very helpful in directing and in supporting. Do we have that now? What are we telling College of Education folks? What are we telling your professors there now? How are you telling them to do what they do? How are you building that, that, that belief in their heads that it's important to go and get students to come in and not only those students that's going to do the research, but those students that might take, have, take a little extra effort mm -hmm. to keep them in and keep them moving and helping them climb, climb the ladder. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Yes, yes you are. Yeah. Yeah, yes, so, yes, you are making sense. It's about how do, how inclusion. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. And, and we, know, we know the political ramifications. We know, we know we're going to go out and get Johnny because Johnny can bounce that basketball. But why are we going out to get Mary? Because Mary can write that poem. So we've got to figure out what do we do and how do we tell the folks that's in the College of Education, don't know about the other colleges, just talking about the College of Ed. How do we tell them, how do we create that idea in their heads of this is what we are about we are about bringing on, inviting, supporting, and helping to those students to climb the ladder. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing for me. And I'm old, I know that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I understand that, but I still think that there are some basic kinds of attitudes that we've got to build within uh, our structures. And those attitudes when we talk about equity and we talk about equality, and I, you know, I always say, I understand equality because equality means that when we sit down at the table, everybody gets a piece of the cake. We got five people there, we got five pieces of cake, everybody gets a piece of the cake. That equity is though, we got that six piece of cake. Who does that six piece of cake go to? That six piece of cake goes to Johnny because everybody that's sitting at that table, four of them, had breakfast. Johnny didn't. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we Johnny, that extra piece of cake. So mm -hmm. how do we how do we begin thinking in that manner to help build the college, to help build the university, so that we're moving both ends of the university up at the same time. And that comes with intentionality. It, it has to be it intentional. It has to be it's intentional. Not, it is not. Yeah. It has to be intentional, it has to be thoughtful, it has to be planned, it, and it has to be, we have to be diligent about it. We just can't pop it. It's got to be diligent, and we take it piece by piece by piece, step by step by step, and we bring together our minds and our thought. You can't tell me we aren't intelligent. You can't tell me who those the faculty uh, at the College of Ed or what, whichever college isn't. We're, we're smart people. We've just got to focus on how, what we want to do and how we want to do it. Absolutely. Right. Um, Chris, I'm sorry, may I make a comment? Yes, you may. Um, uh, Dr. Greer is raised, uh, she's asking some questions that 
requires and have required answers for generations. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is multiphasic, it's multifaceted, it's deep, it's generational, it's intergenerational. There are so many dynamics that have evolved over the neglect of addressing the issues that Dr. Greer is raising that you got academia over here doing this thing. And, you know, I, I love theory, but then again, at the end of the day, we talking about practice. And the question is, where do they intersect toward what? And I will say to you, and I'll go back to my earlier statements. If you're talking about the university's relevance, it's got to go all the way to the beginning because of what has not developed, what has not been put into place. I'll give you an example. If you're talking about education, I think Dr. Greer will agree with this. You can't just drop a kid off in a kindergarten and say, let it fly in today's world. You got to do some really heavy weight uh, early child development investment. Uh, you're going to have to do some prenatal, to prenatal investment. You know, where is the university from birth to from cradle to wherever, let's say in the university? How does it see its role? When I say it's heavy lifting, it's also um, a concentration of resources. How much resources does the university have? Lamont raises this question about the abandonment of this piece regarding the, um, uh, the urban mission and so forth. Well, you do recall the university was also running around trying to compete, what? On a national and an international level with other universities. It was up in its game as an institution. So somewhere in that dynamic, <laughs> Lamont, that, that piece and that focus and, and, and some other focus sort of got dropped to the side because it's, it put its eyes on something else. And that necessarily cut out certain um, in the, uh, programmatic initiatives that they're now trying to regain and to recapture to deal with the questions that Dr. Greer is raising in one instance. So this is a very, very tough question where we find ourselves. It's very tough that there is no panacea. There are multiple institutions that are involved in this. And to the extent the university, uh, I mean, the university, like I say, that, that human capital piece, I mean, it's really all at university. They, they do have the answers to these questions, Dr. Greer. In various aspects of university, the, the answers are there. Mm -hmm. The question is, how are they marshalling that? How are they sharing that? How are they focusing that? And uh, how sustained will that be? So uh, I can go on and on, but it's a very complex thing at this point in time. It's very heavy in terms of what has to happen at this time. And but Senator Neil, you mentioned something that, you know, because the university went from um, the bottom of Conference USA to the Big East, you know, and then now to the ACC. And so well, we look at that status, but who have we left behind in the process? And that's what happens when you make that kind of move. But if you don't make that kind of move, you're still operating on a lower, lower rung. So those things kind of militate against each other when you take your sights for that. So the question is, how do you capture your relevance in terms of issues like Dr. Greer is raising as you lift your profile and uh, can compete to be even a greater institution? It's not a simple matter. Yeah. No, and I, I think it's not simple, and I think it's a great challenge. But even the the statement of the racial, just dealing with the statement of the university, calls you to do more than a standard operation of a university. It I causes guess. you to get deeper because your statement makes it deeper, and it, it, because your state uh, statement makes it deeper. It causes you to do deeper things in our community to live up to the expectations of that statement. Right. So if, if, it, if it's there, it's there because that's the statement of our university now. So it's not about the talent of 10th. It's more than the talent of 10th if you're going to change the racial equality of this community. Right. So that's that's what I see is that it's a great challenge, but it's, it's past the academic challenge. It's a community and a holistic challenge. The university has to continue, continue to do, which they are doing. And I'm all for partnerships to move forward. What can we do? As a museum, how can we partner and bring students to a different level? I get it, but I mean, it's, it's definitely heavy lifting, but it's a lift we have to make. 
Yeah, I agree with you know, that. But, but also, as Dr. Greer and as um, Dr. Cunningham stated, and even Senator Neal, you know, it has to be with intention. Because exactly. even though as you grow and expand, and there still needs to be an intentional effort. And somebody has, somebody has to keep their eyes on the prize. Somebody has to be responsible for making sure things happen or else we can lose everything. You know, Correct. so as you're climbing, you can't just throw everything away. You have to be able, there has to be an intentional focus or someone has to be responsible for making sure that we don't lose what we've obtained, what we've gained, you know, in the process. It begins at the top. Hmm? Yeah, I think Dr. Cunningham is saying that. They have programs in, in effect and I continue going to use those programs mm -hmm. to do just that. Mm -hmm. And I've fallen them. Mm -hmm. Dr. Starks, Dr. Starks, if I'm yes. right. Ralph Fitzpatrick, hi everybody. Hey, hey. Hi, Ralph. I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation today. Thank and you. It, it was a much needed conversation. Mm -hmm. I like to say first and foremost, a couple of things. Number one, I want to Congratulate my friend, Gerald. Thank you, Senator Neal, for your effort leading that charge to land and pull together the TIF proposal for our West Louisville community. Thank you, sir. We thank you for that. That was powerful and it's something that will, I, I just believe, uh, bend the dividends long, long term going forward. So thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm struck by Dr. Greer's comments. Um, I, I'm an old school guy and, and Lamont is glad to see you on the call today and it's good to know Dr. Neal is on the call because you know a lot of times when I get to talking and thinking about the, the tenure, my tenure at the university, it's good to talk to somebody who's been there as long as not long as I. <laughs> um, I was one of those, Gerald, as you know, that arrived back at the university in the early 1970. I was in that second wave of students who were recruited to the University of Louisville um, with Blaine and others having, and you having led the way uh, going forward. And, 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 and the beauty as Lamont mentioned earlier, when I arrived there in 1970, you know, I came there as a first generation college going student, okay? Um, mom put a $20 bill in my hand when I left rural Western Kentucky and said, boy, uh, this is it. You can't come back. Okay. <laughs> so you got to make it. So number one, she set a floor by way of expectation. When I arrived at the University of Louisville, we had people like Alice Houston, Brenda Hart, yes. Hanford Stafford, uh, Gerald, you yes. may remember those individuals. Very much. And they reinforced the notion, number one, we're going to be intrusive in your life, Ralph. That's what they said. And I thought I was pretty sharp, really, like you. I graduated near the top of my class. Some said at the top, hell, I don't know. But the, the point being is, I thought I was a sharp cookie only to be told that we're not just concerned about you getting into the university. We're gonna get you out of here, right, Lamont? Mm -hmm. That's, that's right. what That's what it was all about back then. Yeah, we're gonna okay. get you out of here. So that floor of expectation, and I stress the power of expectation. Somewhere along the line, and this was 1970, year 2000, we went from 200 African-American students, check me, Gerald, if I'm wrong, to more than 2,000 African-American students in 10 years. And that all had to do with the fact that the University of Louisville became a part of the state system. And this is where, as Lamont talked about earlier, this whole notion of with that urban uh, mission being assigned open admissions being assigned. But something happened back in mid 1980s. This is when the university mission flipped from being the urban institution to that of being the metropolitan institution. Yeah. And that happened under the presidency of John Shoemaker. You, you all can remember this. Don Swain's out, John Shoemaker's in. So now all of a sudden to be that metropolitan university, first of all, urban doesn't sound too pretty. Okay, the point that I'm trying to make is we, some people got confused as to whether or not diversity and excellence could coexist. <laughs> mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. They do, in fact, coexist, people. Yes, yes okay? they do. Mm -hmm. We That's proved right. that. We proved that yeah. through university college. We proved that. There was something called the preparatory division years ago. Now, here, here's the point of where I'm trying to go. Lamont, one of the things that you can rest assured of 
is that, and you're right to be concerned about numbers. But Senator Neal did, in his brilliance, more than 20 plus years ago, close to 30, am I correct, Gerald? Been a while. Gerald introduced Senate Bill 398. Check me if I'm wrong, Gerald. No, and did. Senate Bill 398 was designed to do a couple of things. Number one, it was designed to make sure that all state supported institutions lived up to the mandate that was that was framed as a part of what was then called the DSEG mandate that later became the Kentucky Plan for Equal Opportunities. So therefore, if every institution, including the University of Louisville, we're on record, and not just from the leadership of the institution, but your board of trustees is on record for having to approve our metrics and our action plan for those metrics dealing with uh, enrollment of students, retention of students, graduation of students, and that's both at, in this case, the undergraduate as well as the graduate level. And then there's a, there's a employment side to that as well. That piece still exists as of today. And what everybody understands, including the University of Louisville is, should we fail to live up to those commitments and to those metrics, what happens, Gerald? We don't get- Use your money. We lose money mm -hmm. and we lose our ability to secure new academic degree programs. So right. Lamont, I share that just to simply say to you that there is accountability measure that's still there, but the reality of it is, and I agree with Dr. Dr. Greer and, and, and others who have spoken. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham for representing our unit here today. And the reality at the end of the day, we've got to believe still. And the same thing exists. We're still basically, folks, a first generation college going group of kids. I have carried under my leadership, under my supervision, the program called Project Upward Bound since 1976. Okay? Mm -hmm. That program reports to me at the University of Louisville. Why does it report to me? And I've moved Gerald from one point to the other point throughout the university. I kept dragging the program because Upward Bound speaks to the very thing that we're talking about. What does it speak to? It speaks to the fact that these are programs that are open. It's a program designed to work with students who can demonstrate academic potential. That's what we're talking about here, academic potential. And what is it that these students do? I can have 30 graduating seniors in the Project Upward Bound cohort at the end of a given year. And these students will almost secure close to $2 million in scholarship in our financial aid. So you can't tell me that students who come from first generation, low income households and families can't do it. Mm -hmm. This is why it is so important. Dr. Gurr, you can, you can listen to the passion as when she was speaking in terms of what, what it meant to be in a class of hers. You can listen to Lamont when he talked about Andrew Williams, who headed up those Upward Bound programs and what have you. You can listen to it when I talk about my good friend, Blaine Hudson, who's gone on before. You can listen to the, the, the passion and hear the passion when you talk about Alice Houston, who worked at the University of Louisville in the Office of Financial Aid and others. Well, all I'm simply saying is, we have only begun to scratch the surface in terms of making changes in our commitment. The Signature Partnership, as Dr. Cunningham mentioned earlier, it's all about trying to impact and work with the community, impact quality of life issues, quality of life issues. And that's why, Gerald, I want you to know this, our president nearly danced this morning and getting ready to go down to your news conference for the making that announcement. Because I think she understands well what this means in terms of how this university can make it a win-win situation. And I like, and I'm gonna close with this. James Ramsey, and some, that's kind of been a poo-poo name in a lot of different circles, but one of the things that I will always remember about James Ramsey, who happened to be an economist, who often said, it's important that you take one plus one and make it equal three. Mm -hmm. And that's what the beauty of working with community going forward. So, you know, again, Dr. Starks, I, I applaud you and the School of Education 
you know, for this effort. I applaud the panelists who have shared, if you will, uh, and just was very transparent, you know, going forward. And Senator Daniel, what can I say about you, my friend? Thank you. And it's good to see you, man, back in the saddle, you know, doing your thing. Thank you. Well, Ralph, well, Ralph you know, you, you were always a role model for all of us at school. And I remember sending you the Collegiate 100. Remember that? I do. I do. So, yeah. So you've always been the man. So power uh, to you. Power, power, power to you. Man. All right. I like to make one other, I like to say one other thing that something that has stuck with me since I was three years old. And what that was, was my mother when yeah. we lived in one room in an alley, Reed Alley, because my dad had been killed. And what my mother said to us, my sister and I, where you live does not define who you are or who you can be. And sometimes I think we look at students and we don't have that mindset because we see where they live and what they're up against and we make some general assumptions. But where you live doesn't define who you are or who or what you can be. Right. And I think that's something that we need to put back into our frame of reference. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right, um, Dr. Greer, because all too often people look at individual zip code and determine, you know, their destination. And we cannot allow that to happen. Um, yeah, I'm from New Orleans, product of Lower Ninth Ward, you know, and here I am today. But again, uh, people who decided will try to determine my destination. I'm like, no, you're not. But again, um, had a mother and father was, you know, died when I was five. But she said, hey, it's not where you're going. It's not where you are, it's where you're going. So we have to always make sure that we stay true to that. You know, we continue that message. We continue that vision and we have to be able, and we just have to be unapologetic about it. We have to be unapologetic with our kids because our kids are looking for us to stand up for them. They're looking for us to have their back because, and we're standing on the shoulders of greatness. So allow them to stand on our shoulders, but we have to stand up to, and, and be accounted for and, and just, and be unintentional, be intentional about the work that needs to be done. So. Thank you, Dr. Fitzpatrick, for, you know, for joining in. Thank you, Dr. Rita Greer, you know, and again, uh, thank you, panel, you know, for, for your words. And if there's anyone uh, in the, here that's left that would like to be able to make a comment or have a question, then please feel free to do so. Hi, my name is Angela Magnuson. I'm a JCPS teacher. I think I remember you, Dr. Stark, working in human resources for JCPS, yes. maybe with yes. the educator program. I wasn't quite sure if that's um, part of your origin, but um, I'm, I'm really interested. This, this conversation to me just continues to lead back to my experience as a teacher in the classroom. And I had not heard that 57% um, statistic referenced for the amount of students of color in JCPS. I hadn't heard that mentioned in a while, um, but I know that the faculty in the school that I work in does not reflect that at all. It, there's a huge um, gap between our faculty, um, our the non-diversity on our staff compared to the diversity in the classroom. So I, I put into the chat earlier, I'm um, just thinking about uh, really appreciating Dr. Greer, your comments about the connection that has to exist between our universities and our schools and the recruitment and the invitation to serve. And I, I'd like to know um, Dr. Stark or anyone on the U of L staff, if you could speak to um, the types of programs that take that invitation and bring it into the JCPS school system, because I think even more than the diversity, I think we need to reflect the relationship between teachers and students that come that begins with students that were raised up in JCPS because we have such intelligent kids in our community. Yes. I know we have seniors ready to serve and ready to teach. Are we prioritizing recruitment of those students into the College of Ed and into our JCPS classrooms? I was going to see if Dr. Amy Lingo was still here um, to see if she wanted to comment on, on that, but I can, but I just want to give her the opportunity if she was still here. Um, I am. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. So one of the programs, um, we are uh, 
really focusing on diversifying the teacher workforce in a, in a three-pronged approach. One um, effort is around the Louisville Teacher Residency Program. The other um, is a 15-hour diversity literacy certificate that we offer as part of our Masters of Teacher Leader that actually has 15 hours with our, that are delivered by our colleagues in arts and sciences, which really focuses on much of what this conversation does. Um, the uh, teachers, in-service teachers take uh, philosophy of race, foundations of diversity. So it's a really robust program that, and actually that is delivered in collaboration with the Division of Equity and, Impo and Poverty, which Dr. John Marshall um, actually directs. So that is just another way. We're also uh, developing an undergraduate certificate around racial justice. Um, we had a conversation yesterday. So that's something that elementary ed teachers and uh, middle and secondary teachers it's not going to be mandatory, although we would like for it to be, but you know, our candidates only have 123 hours in which to, go to complete a bachelor's degree. So we have to make sure that we get in other required courses. We also have a diversity course that all of our pre-service teacher candidates take as well. So we really try to uh, do as much as possible to show our, our commitment to equity. Deal and you know, and as um, Dr. Lingle stated, I mean, there's still work to be done. Yeah, it's still never you know that we reach a threshold. There's still more work to be done. There's still more opportunities to go out and talk to kids and reach individuals to say yes, you can, and to let them know we need them. Um, I was um, in charge of the MTRP, MTRP programs in Jefferson County at the middle and high school level. And again, in the, in the golden emphasis was to let individuals know that you, we all played school, you know, and to not kill that dream, to let them dream of becoming teachers, to say, yes, you can, and to be able to build on that. You know? And so all too often, we don't build on it. We talk about what's wrong with the profession as opposed to what's right with the profession. And all too often, we're looking at it from a deficit mindset as opposed to what we can do. And so we have to change the mindset and change the context because we need all those individuals to continue to believe that they can. And we have, to let, we have to give them that platform and say yes and give them the strokes necessary to say, yes, you can and we want you and we need you. And we have not done enough of that. And so we need to continue with that push to make that happen, yes. If I may, I, I would like to say, I do think that uh, JCPS and DEP, Department of Equity and Poverty, is doing a great job of raising the awareness of our faculty. Um, and I think Ms. Lingo or Dr. Lingo, I'm not sure, was referring to programs that do the same thing for students. But I just wanted to say that I do still think there is so much untapped potential in our JCPS graduates, our students of color who are graduating from the system. I think our recruitment programs seem to mm -hmm. um, go outside of the state when uh, looking to recruit minority teachers. And I just feel that we could put more emphasis on developing the talent, which I think is something that Mr. Collins was also getting to, um, looking at that untapped potential in the student um, population that may not be high achieving quantitatively, but is really you know, a whole student with so much to offer and could step right into a position as a teacher that um, is ready to develop those student to teacher relationships, which is also something that people are always talking about with teacher development, building relationships, and what better to find teachers from the community to build relationships with families and students in the community. We also have the teaching and learning pathway which offers high school students nine hours of dual credit opportunity in a bachelor's degree. And so we have been doing some uh, strategic recruitment from those high schools that offer that te the teaching and learning pathway and admissions at UofL has actually, if um, offering some additional scholarship money or financial aid package for those individuals because admissions, the admissions office does recognize the need to produce more diverse teachers for Jefferson County. So Angela, um, thank you for, for those questions because that conversation is happening in the College of Education and Human Development in terms of what can we do and we should be doing more and how can we do more? So those questions are being asked 
um, and being pushed to how can we do more with what we have? Because sometimes it's not just about the money we have, but what can we do with the resources that we have and be intentional about the work that needs to be done. So thank you for being here. And um, yes, um, and asking that question because that's something, and Dr. Gray as well, you know, because again, we have to be intentional. Um, if we expect results, we have to be intentional. Any other comments uh, from anyone? Well, um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, Dr. Craddock and I would like to thank everyone for being here and Dr. Lingo um, with your comments and questions and just know that um, you. You know, we take those very, very, very seriously. Um, I am a, in fact, Dr. Rita Greer hired me when I came to Kentucky many, many years ago. And um, I came, went to JCPS so, um, just to get, pick up an application with, and she hired me. So um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Greer, you know, and um, the work needs to be done. And we know that she knows that I'm passionate and committed about the work and I'm thankful for my time in JCPS, but also to be able to continue that passion and that urgency at the University of Louisville in the College of Education and Human Development under Dr. Amy Lingo. So again, um, we just know that um, we know that it's heavy lifting, you know, but it's not something that can't be done. We have to continue to pursue, you know, and push and make some things happen. So I want to thank the panelists, um, Dr. Um, Senator Gerald Neal, Dr. Henry Cunningham, Mr. Lamont Collins. Um, thank you all for being here. And so it's 612. Uh, no, we were supposed to end at six, but it was just such rich conversation. But know that the work doesn't stop here. You know, just because the, just because we're leaving here at six thirteen, work still has to be done, and we all can do something in the spaces and places that we occupy. We all can do something because all too often people think, "Oh my God, it's too big, it's too, I, I can't do it." You know, yes, you can. We all can do something in the spaces and places that we occupy. And bad things happen when good people stand by and do nothing your silence becomes consent. So we need all hands on deck. The urgency is now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Gerald. Yes. 